afternoon about guidelines for uh, creating winning products and services and having a sense of confidence while you do it. All right. So first off is my background. I did go to Carnegie Mellon and Tepper a while ago now. Uh, but as far as my history for importance, I was a student sponge for a long time. Uh, when I was here, I actually participated in something called Moot Corp, or the, it was the, the, what was the Don Jones Center, but there's incubator competitions, and I was uh, the proud winner of something back in that era. It was a lingerie company. And unfortunately, I didn't just run right out and get it going. It, had, it, it hit a few snags, which we won't go into here, but it forced me to go to another direction, and that's when I became what you call a corporate recruit. So I have uh, about a solid eight to 10 year business history working for others, and generally family level um, companies. You'll see the names in a few slides. Uh, and I took all that experience, and I, I spun out and started to do things on my own. So I was either advising on deals to investors, or I was actually looking at projects to take over. So I went from a consultant to a CEO, uh, in a startup, or excuse me, in a turnaround. And from there, uh, I got a little bit more creative and went back into doing design work. Okay, so that's just my flow, but this is what I want to talk about. I view the world of startup as three categories, basically. You're coming at it from direct invention, because you're a designer or product developer. You're going to collaborate on an invention because you're in a process, whether you're on the buy side or, or whatnot, you are looking at collaborating. It's usually about how you compete in business. So for me, those would be, if I was designing something and running a business, my performance in my business, uh, I desire to be highly competitive. Okay? Confidence and competitiveness go very close together. So because I want to be competitive, I go out and I find B to B relationships and end up starting startups which is in industrial history, big companies would you know, start small companies to get the help they needed. And then there's another way to be an entrepreneur, which is about fueling the invention. So it's about deploying resources, and some people just put the money in and the talent advisory work in, and you, you help the creators make something. So I kind of wanted to throw out there what makes an entrepreneur so special. And I think, for me, it's, it's what I've written up here. It's having the ability to deploy your ideas, people, and resources in a way that you manifest your ideas and intentions with your own personal business strategy in a way that creates the most wealth. And you really get to start from that clean slate. And if you build it, it could just create the most unimaginable amounts of wealth but you have one of two choices. You're either going to do it very efficiently and be highly competitive, which means you're not really, you're not really producing to be at the margin. So it's, it's the most wealth possible, not a wealth at the margin. And I can explain that a little more later, but I think it'll become apparent. It's a business-y term. And so with that, doing this on my phone, I'm going to give you, oh, what do we have here? Hmm. Okay, team. Well, let's leave the logos aside for a second. I'll fill in the gaps here. When you're running the business, if you have the idea, which is my corporate history, there'd be Ford Motor Company. They had a subdivision uh, called Lincoln Mercury. They also had Jaguar at the time. After a tour of duty through there, I went to the Gallo family. So it was Ford family, Gallo family. They have a winery, and they also have a glass packaging component. And then, uh, what's not down here is I then moved to the Lauder family. Uh, and then there was Cartier, and then there was a company called Vincent Longo that I ended up actually running and hockey sticking. So all of these things on the right-hand side here are, just want to put it out there because I know if you're just starting out, you might not be thinking at this level of detail. But I can tell you the people with the money and the people that are looking for strategic partners are trying to figure out how you and your product are going to fit into some element of this. And at the very top, above demand management, I guess you could call it would be consumer. So assuming you've got the consumer, but you have to kind of think about all these things. And it can be a little overwhelming. So with that, 
we'll just start with a few basic levels. Your creativity is going to be called into question, whatever this mother of invention that you have. And I have three kind of concepts here to kind of hit a bullseye with. Original research or better mousetrap. How many people hear of original research versus a better mousetrap? Original research. OK. One. All right. And better mousetrap? OK. All right. Um, my thoughts to share on this, OK, how about point of view? Uh, is anybody working in the communication space? Maybe you could call it social media or anything specific. OK. All right. And then you have endurance. OK. So I'll stick to the better mousetrap because we have numbers there. OK. Sorry. All right. So when you're putting together your idea and you're formulating um, what you're working on, there were a couple of things that kind of came up in my own archives that I was looking at. So there was a, a book called Thinking in Time. It was done by authors Newstadt and May in the 80s. Um, but you have to look at the history to understand how you got where you are now. And if you can take your creative project and start to put it on a timeline that explains why you're working on it from where you are, following me? Yeah, OK. So you will inherently start to see two things. One, that there's a flow of ideas and progress in society, but you're also going to start to see there were methodologies for how it was achieved. So not although we are a, a very technical oriented school, and I know we do things with the Department of Defense, if you think about a military strategy for a moment and go with me on this, you will find that there's ideas of, of how you pull your resources together to achieve your objective. And so whenever your idea pops up in a conversation, people are going to start to analyze or ask themselves questions about how are they going to deploy this. And if you can come to a conclusion that you are centralizing resources and giving users an opportunity to compete with each other inside your organizations to develop versus having your sources competing for each other. So there's basically three things. You're doing intel work. You're analyzing and researching. You're putting a co-op cooperative force, which is your basically your military, which is your teams and everything. And then you're going to maybe deal with some counterintelligence because people are going to try to get in and under your work, right? So basically, you're building the better mousetrap. Just take a moment to see where you fit in terms of time. So if you are doing something with social media, there's a big history with social media right now. And at the end, I have some trends we can talk about and sort of what that means. But I'm just saying I wanted to ask about the creativity from that point of view. So from the point of view that you're bringing, you're going to get judged with how you communicate and what, how well you take the criticism. Okay, so without having you know your plan in, in front of me or whatnot, just ask yourself: Can you write it in one sentence? Most people will tell you the elevator pitch is how much you're going to make, what you're making, and when you're going to deliver it. That's you have to get those few points across. Underneath that is there's some element of why it matters to the customer, and then why it matters to you. So the communication and the feedback is largely about a creator being able to have some attachment to their work, and then accept, let's say, some flows of criticism until you get it perfected. All right? And then with the endurance and the forecasting systems and delivery systems, these are just your in-house processes for making sure that your, your, your platforms are working, OK? So if you don't have endurance, if you can't forecast what's going to go on, which is basically your change in iterations. So how many uh, iterations are you going through to actually get your product, and then actually getting it out there? So if you could think of a, a lemonade stand, if you're in the garage, you're on your beta, you're alpha. If you get to the end of your driveway, and you're sitting there with a little lemonade uh, sign and you're trying to sell it for a few few cents, you've gotten through the beta part. And all of this comes up in the in the creativity. So if we're looking at your lemonade, is that am I clear? Some of this is sort of the background conversation before we get to the meat. So okay. 
confidence. Your talent, your production, and your network. All right. I somewhat touched on this a little bit, but with talent, the imagination has to be a full package. So I know there are people that have come in and talked about uh, branding, highly important, right? But you have to discern the branding. So a lot of people say outsource it. If you can make the effort to put forward briefs for your own branding concepts, one, A, your talent will show through, but it will signal to outsiders that you really understand the customer. And if you're saying, oh, okay, well, I do B2B and we don't have to be so well packaged, then it really comes down to your communication processes and how you're talking into the network on the far side. So your production is how well you're going to manage your teams. You have to deliver to the timeline. And everyone's going to be measuring your critical success factors, whether you're controlling them, you're buying them, or you're developing them. And the network, the customers, the suppliers, and the financiers, that's the Rolodex. So part of being in the incubator community is you should be tapping into all of these things. All right, I don't know. OK. All right, and now winning. OK. There's only two things, repeat purchase and sustainability. And hopefully, this will make sense with everything I've just shown you. But customers are invested in your success, and they're buying what you have and others appreciate your success. There's really nothing else that gets considered, in my experience, in the value, how the value of what you're doing is measured. And then your sustainability is about whether or not you have financial transparency, uh, and then your public relations offer other opportunities, the community you're sitting in, okay? So, it's a little bit harsh, perhaps, because I think sometimes in the, in the community of incubating it, it might be like everybody, it's all going to be wonderful. But in the end, this is sort of how decisions fall out. Related to having customers invested in your success, there's a couple of trends that I thought could be worth some discussion, you know. Um, one is related to the network, and it's about keeping doors open for yourself when you're working on your projects. And the, the idea would be, it used to be, you'd be one of two models. You'd keep the doors open and always be friendly and, and you know, never want to turn anyone away. And there's another model that you can actually be very decisive. No, I'm not going to go that direction. And then if you decide you want to come back to that direction, you're, you're going to do something demonstrative. So an example of that would be maybe, uh, recently with uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump, absolutely must have a wall. And then when it looked like it couldn't be a wall, they processed a few things and then suddenly it was a wall and a space force. So you kind of create this sort of extra element. But it's actually becoming a tool that you could use if it buys time in your system. Not to be underhanded with anyone, but you do want to think about what you're building. And if you need some time, you can be a little bit more demanding of saying no to outsiders, because a lot of times people say you have to say yes. So sometimes you can say no, but then think about when you do need to say yes, why? And you don't necessarily have to make a dramatic excuse, but be able to come back for it. Um, help vendors help you. So you might find that your business will grow exponentially if you are a startup helping another startup. I don't know how much that's happened here, but it does actually happen. You can also, there's this idea of working with your, any investment that you have to make in your network. So even if it's where you think you want to put your office, put it in some place where it's going to have a, an extra benefit for you. And it's kind of classical networking, but it will work. And the other thing is thinking about private label. So if whatever you're doing works well, you can do it with others. And you can pull your teams and then basically sell to another, another party in the process of building your revenues, OK? And then there's this idea of blockchain that's floating around. I love it. It's, fin it's fantastic. It requires transparency. So if whatever you're doing, you can build transparency into the, the project, do it. 
And what's funny is you should operate with the transparency. So if you can keep the transparency going through between your idea, your teammates, to investors if you need them, then I think you'll be very poised for the, the upcoming trends of what's going to be demanded of an entrepreneur. There's a lot of things that have been done opaquely before, but it's going to, it's going to shift. And interestingly, if that includes advertising or communications, you might find that one of the trends is people are quite uh, conscious of having their hypocrisy called out. So in terms of whatever you're working on, if there's a point of view that you have to the work and the customer, be aware that sometimes what you're selling is a solution to a problem or something that they'd be concerned about that they don't, they don't want to admit they have the concern for, which makes conversations potentially sensitive but could be very lucrative. All right, so those are what I put up for the slides, okay? And on that, we're going to conclude. But the idea is, for me, I'm an entrepreneur from the beginning to the end. So it's a novel idea to a brand comeback. I collaborate with the like-minded, and I'm kind of educating the next generation. So this talk was to sort of inspire the confidence and test the winning. But it's a little bit of an interactive element. So I put sort of generic material up here so I could kind of engage with you guys on what you're working on to answer any questions or assist. So I can conclude here. But do you have any questions now that we could work on? Or perhaps we would not be live to work on the problems or the, the projects for confidentiality. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So walk you through the process. So where do you want to start with your invention? Testing your creativity and, and things? Where, where are you concerned with getting off the ground? Okay. Okay, so I'll ask a somewhat sterile question. Have you done, how have you done what we would call the classical market research? Uh, on the consumer side, we did okay. a lot of IDI, um, kind of general background market research. So I think we did like 20 or 30 people so far who were classically interested in engineering. On the facility side, I'm having a lot of trouble getting the mix of people to be able to understand more about their concerns and their needs. Okay, so, and you're in this kind of environment. So if, starting with the latter, when you said you're looking to get meetings, so the market research is gonna come from getting the talk to the potential client before you're actually able to service the client, right? Yes. Okay, um, that is where, on my little diagrams that I was sending with you, with the network, okay? Ideally, you wanna find someone that you could explain what, the way you've done it to me, how it works is I now know I need to network connect you with the appropriate potential client. Since you're mentioning to me it's something to do with senior living, I don't necessarily have, let's say, a background in senior living, but I do have a background in you know, global real estate and investment projects, usually in hospitality, uh, hotel and restaurants and commercial things. But basically I could take a look, or you would have someone take a look at what you're working on and help you bridge the gap a little bit. So you need in your network someone that will not be the end client per se, but would basically say this is what the end client needs and this is how you should pitch it, right? And then get on a call or get that introduction to go meet with them. So you basically are going to pre-screen yourself with, the out, with some additional outside advisory help. So I think for you, we need to find that person. Does that sound like that's what you're asking for? I figure if I'm putting out there, someone needs a resource, somebody has to go into the Rolodex to answer that question. Now, what was the, I'll come back to your first part, which was the product itself. Uh, the product itself helps people research some of their information and go to the website, get registered. Okay. And on that side, our major, our biggest concern is acquisition costs for new 
Okay. All right. So two parts. Have you had anyone tell you whether or not they think your, your platform is a viable market? Anyone want to buy the service? Uh, we have competitors. Uh, okay. Okay, everything that you've just told me, you can put on one eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and show me. So, schemey, scammy, these words that you're throwing at me in the dictionary, what does that look like? Just so I can prove whether or not in my own mind what you've said is accurate. Have you done that exercise? Uh, the definition of what makes you think everything that you've just told me, could you put it on a piece of paper with an example? Okay. Could you also then tell me what you think the estimated acquisition cost is? No. Okay. Um, two things with that. Calls into question whether or not some of the statements you made would actually be accurate. See how I'm kind of like kicking the, the tires a little bit with, with the idea, which I appreciate you throwing out. Um, you're going to have to link the two a lot more aggressively. And maybe turn it around for yourself and say, if I had a fairy godmother who told me she would give me not everything, but she'd give me a few, few precious coins if I could make a statement and test it out, and then she'd give me a whole lot of coins. So you have to come up with some estimate of ex, ex, excuse me, acquisition value, and if you have that, can you afford to do it yourself? So how small can you make the number to actually test it on your own and maybe get you know, 10 people? or get 10 people this way and you know, 150 people this way. Of course, that doesn't make a big business, per se, but it, you have to test it. So it's not just about words and writing what I know your intentions are and what I'm hearing, but I would tr take that little exercise and, tr and try to do it and see where that would lead you. And that comes into the little bit of the talent and the imagination slide. Like what, be a little imaginative with how you start to, to value what you feel is the truth. You're great. <laughs> Does anyone else have a, a thought or a question? To How many people are feeling really confident about what they're doing? OK. All right. How many people are fully funded? You know what? I think, OK, it's a good question. So funded enough to get yourself started where you want to go, like, like literally just to get a prototype? Because we're. When we were talking, okay, good, good. When we were talking, uh, or I was discussing and basically talking at you, let's be honest. Uh, when I mentioned um, in there about your efforts and the lemonade stand, basically being in the garage is called a prototype. You've got to get a prototype to prove the point. So how many people have coded to a level that they feel that they have a working prototype? Very good. Okay. So... Are you feeling confident? I mean, I would imagine if you had a working, I think everybody's just a little like arm tired. They're like, I don't want to. So you're confident then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. We're, um, we're working in automation with our dialogue session. Okay. Um, the way we're doing that, that automation is by having a direct communication with the patient using a common system on each of our chat lines. Um, okay. Okay, got it. Say no more. Say no more. All right. So how long have you been doing it? Uh, about eight months now to a year. Okay. Eight months to a year. How much longer did it take or how much more quickly did it take to actually get your, your, your prototype ready? The majority of that time, it's just kind of forming the idea and start actually So you feel good about that, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is like a trigger. You, if you need to raise money, walking in and saying, I did it in eight to ten months, and you feel good about the fact that it took you eight to ten months. Not everybody can sit and read code, but they are going to notice the difference between it took me eight to ten months and I thought I'd, you know, somebody else would have gotten it done in five. That's, you know, you're going to be evaluated. So I think I'm kind of bringing this approach to thinking about things to kind of help you set up whatever you might be wanting to write about where you're going to take your product. You see what I mean? So you should have had your hand up. You have some good confidence elements there. Now, in terms of winning, how many people feel like with that last slide? I mean, it was all about sustainability, all right? So there's a, that's you, right? That's the first slide when I said you can make 
so much wealth for society. Not, it's just not about your own personal wealth. You get there because every day you're going to wake up and make decisions. So an exercise would say, like, envision what your business looks like at the end, even though you don't have it. Every day, to the extent that you want to be involved in operations, you're going to make choices, right? So at this juncture, how many people know whether or not they want to stay in their business as a CEO versus just maybe be the lead, lead technician and you know, turn it over to somebody else? OK. You're like, maybe, maybe. Thinking maybe you want to do the CE or maybe not. I, OK. Um, that'll, that'll come up quickly. And if, if they're not saying it like, directly, they're going to observe it. And they're going to try to like, figure it out. Because a lot of people say, it's all about the teams, the teams, the teams, the teams. So in the envisioning process, be able to answer like time. Think in terms of time. So part of it was the history of how you came to be. And then there's the other part of the future, which is forecasting things. OK. Um, and so we have some winning. We have some confidence. We have, I think, some shrewd, shrewd questions to be building to get your project where you want it to go. Um, some, I'm trying to think of, I asked if people had coding. Oh, somebody had a consumer product, right? Maybe, maybe, OK, I don't know. Just trying to see um, if there's anything else anyone wanted to talk about or share. Or if they're like, OK, this was very nice, but yeah, OK. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, there's a lot of fear. People want their, their products to be perfect. Uh, physical products, you want them to look good. You don't want to lose traceability. There are all these reasons why you wouldn't necessarily put your product out there yet. Okay. Um, so getting from the garage to the end of the yeah. driveway at yeah. the lemonade so, stand. You know, I have some personal comments, yeah. All right, so given the group, let me ask another question. Is there anybody here that is in the situation that's just been mentioned? You're somewhere between sitting in the garage, and everybody knows you know, you're up there and with the door down doing something in there, but we don't know what, and getting all the way to the, the end of the driveway with your little lemonade stand. Is anybody, how about think they might have that issue? No? OK, so we're going to go solo. We don't have any bounce off with. So I think there's two things. Um, people that are usually running to get out of the, uh, the garage, um, they're usually money is one element, right? So if they have a sense that there is profit to be made, that really pushes them down the driveway a little more quickly. So in terms of your uh, personal organization, a lot of times I find that Sometimes money doesn't get put into the mix soon enough. I guess that's the best way. And you think, well, wouldn't that be part of the natural process? If you are going to be selling something, you'd be thinking about you know, how much money you're going to make at the end. It's not so much about that fabulous pot of gold, but it's the idea of testing someone who is, do they just want to think about things a lot? Or are they actually committed to thinking about an idea, and then putting it into a, a process where teams of people start working on it. And it becomes that sort of organizational culture and the company part. So one of the things you can do is start to, to sort of introduce the idea of cash flow or, or income statement, profit and loss, not just thinking about the cost side. Because a lot of times what you'll find is they, they're very good at knowing what it's going to cost them to do it, because they're really good at getting the resources together, because that's what they enjoy. But then there's that sort of revenue layer. And then you know, how, how will you sell it? So sometimes saying, just put the web page up and see who will come, may be better prefaced with, hey, look, we have to take a few steps to see if you know, there's going to be a demand for it. And then come up with a list of things, not just the, the website, 
even if it's just into the, the community or the, if it's an academic related project, putting it out there amongst some students. There are things that you can do to create a list that doesn't necessarily threaten the, the, the research scientist, the, the inventor, however you want to look at it, that gets you an observational feel of whether or not they're really going to come out of the shell, which will help you in your organization not waste resources attending to, to opportunities that we're really not going to manifest. Does that make sense? So light the revenue fire a little bit. Okay. Um, but the, great question. Thank you. <laughs> and anything else? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in your question, are you asking about how you filter the assistance to not sort of lose your way and stay true to what you think your roots are? Okay, so as I've done things, you know, I've, I've put products into market and been successful. I, I've always gone through that element of, is anyone going to like it? Do you think they're going to like it? Do you think it's going to work? And then you're going you're gonna to get feedback, and some people are going to tell you they, they, uh, they think it's okay, right? Or they're going to love it, or they're going to totally dis dislike it, okay? First rule for that, how do you keep yourself straight? Significant energy toward one or the other, really gravitating yes, really gravitating no, should make you feel good. Because it, it's, a, it's a sort of a polarized guttural response. And that does prove to be very effective in terms of, sometimes it's called niche, okay? But you would discover that there is an element here. Okay, now, if you're in the process where you haven't presented the final prototype and you're still doing the, the research, the focus groups, or getting the access to the clients, I've, there have been other uh, presentations on going through an incubator process where you can do government grants and you go through platforms to basically learn on someone else's dime and time. Okay, when you're going through that element, you have to be very respectful, but keep your ears open for the amount of excitement, whomever you're talking to, okay? So there are three people, right? There's you, there's the client, and then there's that third party intermediary, right? When you're listening to the client, you're, it's a barometer for you to want to understand how much they would actually want to put money on the table to, that night if you told them your product was ready, right? They're going to generate a response to you Again, it's ideal if they either absolutely love it. The problem in these situations is you don't usually get the absolutely do not love it. Because then people want to be pleasant and politically appropriate. Remember I mentioned earlier about not wanting to close the doors? Right? So then the, the person that's with you, with the experience that I mentioned that they might have and seeing what you want to build, they're also reading the situation for you. So you, then you have to have a conversation afterward and say, okay, we didn't get that sort of home run, here was the check, but we got this feedback and ask and, and go back and forth on what they're thinking. And since you're the talent and you kind of know what it's gonna take to do it, unless they're gonna jump right next to you on the, your shoulder and start either programming or designing or whatever, that conversation that you have, it has to be meaningful in the sense that you feel personally empowered, that whatever it is you're designing, you feel better about it. So if, if that, resource says to you, I think we need to keep going down this road, and you're starting to get a sense that they just want to be aligned with you as a startup, or they're going into the meetings trying to get other elements out of the meeting besides just your own best interest. Kind of see where I'm putting that? Could you imagine that in the conversation if you feel like you're getting lost? Is that one of the reasons you might feel they don't have your back? So I would, my personal recommendation would be to do two to three meetings max with that type of advisor, consultant, a support group, person, whatever. And then if you still feel that way, no more. You, can, you could be done, you could say one and done, but 
go one or two, and if you, if you don't feel it, move on from using them as a, as a barometer assistant, okay? Because it probably means they're not going to get your network connection that you need. Okay, does that help answer what do you think? You can be pragmatic and say, if I put this product out the door right now, could somebody sue me? If I put this product out right now and I'm trying to tell people it's not ready, are those people going to be somewhat concerned if you say, I think we could have you know, a million Yelps that this is awful? Like, If you're starting to make a case where there's something that's called just good enough to actually work, you're kind of getting to that threshold if, if you want to start to move forward and have resources to do more things when you've gotten past any of those stumbling blocks that you know that you could have a complete failure or something that could wipe you out do, do you know what I'm saying so if you can get to just good enough that people that want to put more money into the company or or people that are, are in the marketing space are like we're ready to go we're ready to go we can have it now and then that's how you could decide for yourself that it might not be absolutely perfect but it, it could be a help out there. And you're not going to necessarily be afraid of, you know, lawsuits or uh, failure in field, right? So you can kind of give and take. You can say, well, I'm going to move on to the next thing, and they're going to have jobs to do too. So they'll go, they'll go do the jobs on your, your first one, and then you'll have the second one. Make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Some quiet minds. Um, anything else? Seeing it practically in... Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, let let's see. Um, we had one person. Was it just one person with? The, no, we had a couple with consumer product. It just could be social oriented, right? So. I think one of the more fun ones to talk about is a cosmetics company, all right? So it was bankrupt. I came in as the CEO and hockey sticked it. Uh, went international. It, the name of the company, I apologize, now I'm realizing you never got to see those pretty logos. So um, it was called Vincent Longo Cosmetics. I don't know if any of the ladies recognize that name. Um, that is basically doing entrepreneurial work with cement blocks. Because in a turnaround situation, you're basically taking all the skill sets that we've been thinking about, inventing new product, but coming from a place where you're capital constrained significantly. So heavy debt and a potential to, to lose you know, distribution and everything else. So the first thing that had to happen was the whole product line had to be you know, reformulated. And so to that last question that we had, like, well, how do you know when enough is enough? And, and you can just put it forward. You have to be very clear in that envisioning process that I mentioned about seeing the whole company. I just did an exercise. And I said every single product that I wanted to have developed across the whole line of, of cosmetics, which ones did I think were most important to the consumers? Then I would go there first, even if it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to do, but I will go where the consumer is first. So in your startup, and you're thinking about, I have this product, I have that product, there's many things that you could do, go where you think the consumer is going to res respond and resonate with you first. Then after you do that, you get a cash flow influx. You got some money in the bank. The next step is to, to breathe and say, okay, I have a list of products that I'm executing, but now I need to have all the teams and the resources. So if I want to do marketing and advertising, if I, if I have to get a new warehouse, you don't have those things yet, but you might need a, a, an office to have at least 50 programmers at some point. You have to think about how you're going to get there, and you start making some trade-offs. Budgeting, you know, doing a little budget exercise. So I had one product turned into 400. Great. But the idea was for each one of these products that was coming, it was building a team from no one, replaced everyone, to over 50. 
right? Small period of time. And when you're asking the confidence part, it will start to balloon, you know, don't want to get a big head, right? But you'll, you'll get the feedback from the network that you're sitting in. So all the partners that you're working with, instead of having questions about what should the next thing that we do, the C will change and they'll, they'll be excited about could you do this next part, right? And in that environment, when I mentioned, you know, working startups make startups, well, it started happening in a big way. So it was, you know, basically paying companies to code stuff. We turned it into a platform that they could start to sell that service somewhere else, right? And it's on all sides of the business. So I think when I put that first chart up, or the first uh, quote, and there was all these things on the right-hand side, in life you get training to go through X number of them. That's your choice as the entrepreneur inventor. You're focused on the product right now. The more in-depth you become on wanting to do each of the next ones, it just dictates how much more involved you stay in the business. So I think that sometimes in the incubator environment, when people don't want to come out of the garage to get to the end of the driveway, they might be afraid that they're going to get sucked in to doing all these things <laughs> that they, they don't necessarily want to be doing. So to be honest with yourself, what you want to do, if, you, if you're not jiving with all that, then you need to have people in the resource environment pool that are helping you find the collaborative partners that can run the business side of it. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, in terms of success, you know, you, you win uh, an Oscar, you, or you go to the Oscars, you have your products be on the Emmy list when somebody wins an Emmy for hair and makeup and they're using your stuff, international, celebrities A-list model, free editorial starts flowing at you, um, and you've paid back all the debt. <laughs> like, so the success numbers were there um, at the end, but I, I basically started with that simple concept of what do I get to the customer with first, and then I just, over time, just keep laying out, and that's where it never changes. It never, never comes to set budgets, and so that everybody thinks, okay, this year the bake shop in-house is gonna have 30 million to spend. The bake shop doesn't need 30 million, then you redirect the money and you appreciate everybody in the bake shop with a nice bonus for the fact that you only needed to give them 15 million this year. See, it's not on the margin, basically. Um, did that kind of answer the question without, you know, the just, okay. All right, I think we're done. Anyone have anything else? Nope, okay. I don't see anyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs>